Hello, and welcome to the Faculty Forum Online, a program of the MIT Alumni Association. I am Lou Alexander, the Director of Alumni Education at MIT, and will serve as moderator this morning. As you can tell from your screens, this is an interactive platform that will give you the opportunity to ask questions. If you would like to do so, simply enter your first name, geographic location, and the question. For our part, we will do what we can to get to as many as possible within the 30-minute time frame that we have. Our guest this morning is Tom Malone, professor, the Patrick J. McGovern Professor of Management at Sloan. In addition, he is a professor of information technology, the director of uh, the Center for Collective Intelligence, and the project head for the Climate CoLab. Welcome, Tom, and thank, thank you, you. Uh, for uh, coming in this morning. Pleasure to be here. Uh, now, to get into this, uh, Tom will focus uh, on the Climate CoLab today, so let me turn it over to him to tell us a little bit about the work that they do there. Certainly. So, there's this problem. Let's bring up the slides, if you can. This problem of what to do about global climate change. Many people would say this is one of the most important problems facing humanity today. It's a very big, hard, complicated problem. It's affected by all of our actions and can potentially affect all of us. Many people would also say that the mostly top-down approaches we've been using to deal with this problem in the past haven't really worked very well. So those are all reasons for pessimism. But there's at least one reason for optimism, and that is we now have a new way of solving really big, hard, complicated problems that wasn't even possible 15 years ago. If you think of examples like Wikipedia and Linux, they show how it's now possible to harness the collective intelligence of thousands of people all over the world to work together on really big, hard problems at a scale and with a degree of collaboration that was never possible before in history. So our goal in the Climate CoLab project is to use that crowdsourcing approach and apply it to the problem of figuring out what we humans can do about global climate change. To do that, we've created an online platform called the Climate CoLab and a community of people using that platform that includes some of the world's leading experts on climate change science and policy and other topics. It also includes over 12,000 people, business people, scientists, policymakers, software developers, NGO members, all kinds of people from literally almost every country in the world. And together, this community is working on developing and analyzing proposals for what we humans can do about climate change on topics ranging from eating vegetarian diets to responding to sea level rise. Now, most of the people in this community aren't MIT alumni, but we think that MIT alumni, many have, because of their backgrounds, an unusually, unusual opportunity to make some of the most important contributions to this global conversation. So how does it work? Well, anyone, MIT alums or others, can create proposals for what they think should be done. These proposals can include ideas about technological changes, economic changes, political changes, educational changes. Anything they want to propose can be included in these online proposals. And to be sure the proposals are grounded in the actual physical and economic realities we face, each of the proposals at the global level needs to also include some assumptions about the emission reductions that would result from the actions proposed. And then these assumptions are inputs to a set of computer simulation models that are built into the online platform that calculate the likely impacts of the things proposed in terms of things like temperature change, sea level rise, and so forth. Now, the main way we've organized activities in our community over the last few years is through a series of annual contests. The winners of these contests are chosen by both expert judges and by a vote of all the members in the online community. 
And the, in the first few years, the winners presented their ideas in briefings at the United Nations in New York and the U.S. Congress in Washington, D.C. Last year's winners presented their ideas to potential implementers and experts in a big conference we had here at MIT last November. Now, also in the early years of the Climate Collab, we had contests each year on what to do about the whole problem of climate change. But in the last couple of years, we've begun to break this problem down into more focused sub-problems with separate contests in a number of different areas. Uh, we have, for instance, uh, an, a staff or a community of over 100 experts and others who are helping to manage, at this point, about 19 separate contests on topics ranging from how to generate electric power with fewer emissions, how city governments can adapt to the changes caused by differences in the climate, like rising sea level, and even things like how can we change cultural attitudes about climate change. I thought you might be interested in seeing some examples of some of the proposals that are coming in in all these different areas. So the first example I'd like to show you is the grand prize winner in last year's contests across all the contests. It was a proposal from a research group at a Canadian university about how to use aerial infrared photography to help see and hopefully reduce heat wasted and escaping from homes and other buildings. Here's the video that group sent in to describe their proposal. Calgary Department of Geography, Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And this is my research team. The solution we propose is heat, heat energy assessment technologies, a free geo web service designed to visualize the amount, location, and cost of invisible waste heat leaving your home, communities, and cities as easily as clicking on your house in Google Maps. The honorable mention across all of last year's contests was another proposal, this one from an NGO in China. Their proposal was for something they call the China Dream, to develop and promote this aspirational lifestyle for Chinese consumers that's much more sustainable than, say, the American Dream. As you'll see in their video, the leader of this proposal was an MIT alum, Course 6. We need the sound for this video. reframe sustainability, and reshape consumerism. To help 1.3 billion Chinese see what a beautiful dream we can dream. And this is what we call Xiang, a happy and harmonious dream. A new China dream has captured our imagination across the country. Now to succeed in making the new China dream a reality, we must show the dream in action, share the dream through trusted communities, seed it in media and ad campaigns, and we must change the social norms of what the heart of prosperity means. So in addition to those two videos, here's a picture of some of the other winners from last year's contests, um, uh, the, uh, shown at our conference last November. The video, or the, the picture includes winners like a software developer from North Carolina who had a proposal about how to use fusion power. Another winner is an American expat living in Nicaragua with a proposal about reforestation. Another one is a former World Bank expert from Austria who had a proposal about how to use crowdfunding to support the development of renewable energy in the developing world. Another one of my favorite proposals shows how sometimes High-tech solutions aren't the best, but sometimes low-tech solutions can be even better. This proposal comes from an NGO in India, and they suggest how, for many subsistence farmers in India, rather than using expensive and very emission-producing diesel irrigation pumps, farmers might be better off to use foot-powered treadle pumps. Here's their video. Development Enterprises India, IDEI, is a not-for-profit organization 
committed to working with smallholder farmers in India by promoting sustainable irrigation technologies. IDI is promoting treadle pump, a foot operated water lifting device that is used for irrigation by smallholder farmers. Each treadle pump prevents half a ton carbon dioxide emission annually as it replaces diesel use. I am pleased to share with you the success story of one of our user farmers who has switched from using a higher diesel pump to treadle pump. Today, we will meet Budhiram and his seven member family. Budhiram says that his half hectare land was in a sad state. This was something he and his family accepted like a bitter pill. He borrowed money to hire a diesel pump to irrigate his land. This was his big hope and a lot of things were riding on its turning successful. But each step with diesel meant money down the drain. Thus reluctantly attending a meeting payoff. In the farmer meeting he attended with a lot of reluctance that turned his life around he says. As he peddled he saw that a green cover was slowly creeping in. In the open market it fetched a good price. So you can see we're getting lots of interesting proposals from all kinds of people all over the world, many of whom from places you might never have expected, certainly people who would never have been involved in our global conversation about this problem otherwise. Now, once you've broken the problem down into pieces like this, the other thing we need to do is to put the pieces back together. So starting a couple of weeks ago, we introduced the first of what we call our integrated contests. This one about how to take proposals and ideas from all the different contests and integrate them into combined proposals at the global level that include a set of coherent, consistent things that will hopefully together deal with the whole problem. So in the long run, we hope that the interactions, the global conversations made possible by the Climate Collab can help business people, scientists, policy makers, and many others develop and gain support for better plans for climate actions than anything we would ever otherwise have done. Thank you. Doing? This is uh, uh, you know, a, a problem that is absolutely massive in its complexity and scope, and you've developed quite a uh, an interesting and wonderful tool to begin organizing ways to affect it. Um, and since we are uh, actually addressing an alumni audience today, I think the first question that comes to my mind while we're waiting for questions to come in is, what can alumni do? What can MIT alumni do uh, to uh, help the Climate Collab? Funny you should ask. <laughs> I actually have a slide that suggests some of the possibilities. Uh, the first and perhaps most important way alumni can be involved is by helping to create better proposals in the Climate Collab. The results are in some sense only as good as the ideas that people put in. And we think, as I said before, MIT alumni are unusually well qualified to come up with really good, interesting, innovative ideas for what we can do about the problems of global climate change. So I, I hope that many people in our audience if they have ideas of their own about what should be done, we'll go to the website and create a proposal either by themselves or perhaps with a team of other people they already know. Or they may find proposals that are already there that they think are interesting and they, they'd like to ask the people who've already started with that proposal if they can join the team and make it even better. Any, any person can also comment on proposals that are already there. They can uh, indicate their support for the proposals that are there and during the voting period they can vote for proposals on the site. In addition to those proposal creation activities, there are also a number of other ways alumni can be involved. Uh, one is we're specifically looking for reviewers for some of the different contests. For instance, the global integrated contest that I described a moment ago, we're looking for people who can help the judges review the proposals in that contest by evaluating how well integrated and how consistent all the different sub-proposals included in a given integrated proposal are. We think MIT alumni will be unusually well suited for doing that and many other kinds of reviewing, so we hope people can volunteer to be involved in that way. We also are having another Climate Collab conference this November. We would love for alumni to attend that either in person or online. 
And we also have a crowdfunding campaign, uh, so alumni can be involved in helping to uh, support the actual operations of that conference. Uh, finally, we have several opportunities, a number of opportunities for alumni to serve as expert advisors and judges for the different contests starting mm -hmm. in next year's set of contests. And also each, con each contest has one or more what we call climate collab fellows who may not be world-class experts, but they're knowledgeable about the area and they help manage the kind of day-to-day -day operations mm -hmm. of different contests, different fellows and different contests. So I think that in a certain sense, MIT alumni have an, a real opportunities, opportunity. You might even say an obligation to help the world solve this really big complicated problem using the talents and the knowledge and the experiences they have. Well put. I, I think I, I, I will just mention that uh, at the end of this and certainly on our archival page, we will have links to um, the Climate Collab and people you can contact. So uh, that information will be available. Uh, questions are starting to come in, but let me ask one other question, Tom, bef before we get to those. Uh, and, uh, in May, uh, President Reif announced the uh, formation of a new environmental initi initiative here at MIT. At the same time, he called for, quote, a campus um, conversation on climate change. How does the Climate Collab fit into this? Well, we're actually in conversation now with the committee that's organizing this campus conversation. And while nothing official has been decided at all, uh, I personally think, and uh, the committee seems very open to the idea of including the Climate Collab as part of that process. I think the Climate Collab has the potential to make this conversation much more constructive and much more engaging of a far broader range of people, including not just the people who come to lectures here on campus in person, mm -hmm. but many other people even on campus who don't come to a particular lecture, or hopefully our alumni community all over the world who couldn't come to on-campus lectures, and for that matter, even many other people around the world who aren't MIT alums or necessarily members of the MIT community, but have very interesting and useful potentially ideas about what we can do both as MIT and as the world about this problem. Excellent. Well, let's jump into the questions now. Uh, Tom from Acton asks, and uh, this is uh, getting right into it, uh, what's your response to people who question climate science? Good question. So the first thing to say is that the Climate Collab is not what I would consider, what we would consider an advocacy organization. We as the organizers of the Climate Collab are not advocating in any particular view at all about the state of the science or what we should do about whatever is happening. On the other hand, I think if you really believe that there is no such thing as climate change, you probably wouldn't be very interested in the question. Um, uh, the other thing to say is even though I don't consider myself personally any kind of expert on climate science. I do know through my work on the Climate Collab, many of the world's leading experts on this topic, including many of our MIT faculty members who are real experts in this area. And uh, my clear sense from all the people I've talked to and everything I've read is that there, there really is a consensus among serious scientists about this question. Uh, some people, especially in the United States, see this as a kind of political question, and if you're a Democrat, you believe in it, and if you're a Republican, you don't. Uh, but I think it's very uh, convincing to me to note that among my friends here on the MIT faculty, uh, the Republicans believe this is happening yes. also. <laughs> Even some of the very conservative Republicans yes. who've studied this matter professionally and scientifically believe that climate change is happening, and that it is in part caused by human activities. Uh, let's uh, jump out of the U.S. for a question from Fabio in Brussels, who uh, asks, well, he says, the Wikipedia collects information from the general public, yet Linux collects IT codes from IT experts. How does the Climate Collab balance collecting proposals from experts and from the general public? What is the Collab strategy? Is it to be more like Wikipedia or Linux? Interesting question. Um, the short answer is we believe that the, that the key is to balance contributions from experts and the general public. 
and that the general public itself includes many people you'd consider experts or many people who can contribute as much as experts even though they may not be yet recognized as such. Not everyone by any means, but there are certainly people in the general public who can contribute very substantially to our problem. Uh, one of the key issues about how to balance or, or combine experts and the public is illustrated by our experiences in the very first year of the Climate Collab. The very first year we were inspired by Wikipedia and we thought let's just put, put things out there and have anybody can create proposals and anybody can vote on the proposals they like. And what happened that year was that the winning proposal, the one that received the most, most votes by far, was a proposal called 350 parts per million or bust. It was put in by a graduate student working with us at the time. Uh, and the student said, I'm going to just test the limits of the simulation model that was included. And I'm going to try to sort of maximize the reduction of emissions. So he put in the maximum reduction the model allowed, which was something like reducing all emissions in all regions of the world by 99% within about 20 years. Now, that led to fewer emissions. It led to 350 parts per million atmospheric concentration of carbon. And that was very appealing to many people. So many people voted for it. But every expert we talked to said, short of something like nuclear holocaust or a global pandemic, there's no way this could actually happen. So that's what convinced us that uh, Crowds, while they can be very good at some things, like generating ideas, aren't always, in the aggregate, best at assessing things like the feasibility of ideas. So in all the subsequent contests, we've had several rounds where expert judges pick a set of semi-finalists and finalists, which they believe are all at least feasible, even if they're not the ones the judges themselves personally like best. And then the crowd gets to vote only among alternatives that we at least know are feasible. You know, uh, touching on crowds, uh, Richard in San Francisco asks a, a question that, that, that is related here. He says, last fall's crowds and climate conference was a huge success. What can real-time crowds do that virtual crowds cannot do? Interesting question. By that, I assume he means real-time and face-to-face -face crowds though we did have both kinds at the conference last year and we expect to do so again. We had people attending both online and in person. Uh, there are still, however, things that people face to face can do that don't seem to work as well online. Um, people face to face shake each other's hands, they eat food together, uh, they run into random, have random encounters with other people in the crowd and I think we still form a kind of social capital more easily when we meet people face to face than in many kinds, not all, but many kinds of online interactions. Yeah. So we think both are important. We're trying to take advantage of both in the activities of the Climate Collab. Uh, Tamara in Cambridge uh, sends this question. Sustainability by definition goes beyond climate change as an environmental issue. It includes social and economic issues. How is CoLab addressing the larger sustainability goals? So uh, the Climate CoLab focuses primarily on the question of climate change. Um, uh, as the questioner suggests, there are a number of aspects of that question. It's, not, it's certainly not just a scientific or a technological question. It involves many kinds of social and political and other questions. But to keep the conversation focused, we've focused on that question to begin with. However, we think that the approaches we've used in the Climate CoLab, both the software itself, which is open source software, and all the ideas about how to organize sequences of contests and so forth, we think that all those approaches are imminently applicable to many other kinds of questions, many other kinds of problems as well. So one thing we've thought about, for instance, is using this approach for a broader set of sustainability challenges. We think it's also applicable to many other kinds of societal problems like education mm -hmm. and employment and potentially crime and things like that. We think it's also applicable to business problems like 
uh, what kind of strategy a business should follow. This provides a way that people throughout an organization, say, could be involved in a much more constructive and, and um, uh, detailed way in coming up with strategies for a whole organization. Sounds like a very rich platform you've developed. I mean, they can be very flexible. I mean, this is well, we think so. Uh, from our point of view, by the way, since we're researchers in the Center for Collective Intelligence, uh, not climate researchers ourselves, uh, we see this as an example, the first of what we hope will be many examples, of how to do very large-scale collective problem solving. Right. Well, here's a little bit um, uh, a different one. Uh, Tom in Houston asks, how does this relate to the work on carbon capture and storage by the MIT Energy Initiative or other climate-related research at MIT? So we work closely with the MIT Energy Initiative and the faculty members involved with them. Many of them are advisors uh, in the different contests we have, and the MIT Energy Initiative was a co-organizer of the conference last year, and we hope they will be again this year. So, so we're certainly related to that organization and many other people and organizations around MIT involved in climate change, like the Joint Program and the MIT Sustainability or the Sloan Sustainability Initiative. Um, the specific topic of carbon capture and storage and sequestration, uh, that's a, an area in which we hope to have a number of good proposals in several of the contests. In particular, uh, that's especially relevant in the contest on generating electric power, uh, yes. where um, some, we had some very interesting proposals last year and we hope to have many more. You know, I mean, uh, the um, uh, reference to the um, uh, conference uh, has come up a couple of times, and I would uh, uh, say that uh, from your um, web page on the Climate Coal Lab, people can actually access uh, some videos from this. They're, they're quite interesting. Uh, we're down to a couple of minutes, and uh, let's uh, take another question from the EU with Daniel in London. And this is uh, one area we haven't touched on. How can we bring the ideas that are cultivated in CoLab to policymakers and government officials? Excellent question. As I said a little while ago, we have done some work in that regard already. Several, in several of the early years of the Climate CoLab, we arranged special briefings for uh, key uh, officials of the United Nations in New York and uh, a congressional staff briefing in Washington, D.C. Uh, but we're very eager to make even stronger connections with policymakers in the U.S. government, in other countries' governments, in the United Nations, and in any other uh, agencies or organizations uh, that are concerned with this problem. Uh, so uh, that's an example of another way that a MIT alumni could potentially help, is helping to make introductions and uh, bring uh, uh, people from those other governments or organizations uh, into contact with and hopefully into helping to create climate collab proposals and contests in the areas that are of interest to them. I want to squeeze in one last question. I know we're, we're fast running out of time, but it's from Onaje in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Is there a follow-up to help the winners obtain funding to move their proposals forward? Um, that's something we're very interested in. Yeah. Uh, the grand prize winner last year received a $10,000 prize, uh, but we're very interested in uh, other kinds of financial support to actually help implement the ideas that people propose. So again, if people know of sources for that, uh, perhaps even some MIT alumni themselves might be interested in doing that. We think that's a, a very interesting possibility for providing even more encouragement for people to submit proposals in, in the first place and even more help to them in actually implementing the good ideas they develop. Well, alumni, you've heard it here. Uh, this is a challenge for you, and there will be plenty of opportunities for you to, uh, to, to help. And certainly, uh, you will see uh, information uh, on, on the website, our website and the archives about how to be in touch with Tom Center and to uh, find ways that you might be able to contribute. Um, Tom, uh, thank you so much. I mean, this has been a very insightful uh, uh, chat. And uh, for our viewers, we encourage you to continue the discussions in our blog, Slice of MIT. Uh, the link will be on the screen following this. So this brings us to the end of uh, these uh, faculty chats for this season. Join us again in the fall when we begin another academic year. So for today, June 16th, 2014, this is our uh, snapshot of work here at MIT. Thank you for joining us.
Tom, thank you for, for participating. Thank you. Thank you.